Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning as we gather around God's Word on this Trinity Sunday, and we're going to hear what God was willing to put on the line for you. We begin by singing our opening hymn, 506, Glory Be to God the Father. We turn to page 219 for the order of matins. Please stand. O Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our psalm today is Psalm 29, which you can find in the front part of your hymnal. Friendly reminder, there are no page numbers. The psalms are simply in numerical order. And we read Psalm 29 responsively, half verse by half verse. That means I read up to the red asterisk, and you can respond with the rest of the verse. We read responsively Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf. The voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. May the Lord give strength to his people. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue our worship with hymn 504, Father Most Holy. Please be seated. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading for Trinity Sunday comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, the sixth chapter, the first eight verses, beginning on page 726 in your pew Bibles. And our Old Testament reading is known as the calling of Isaiah. Isaiah receives a vision of God's throne room. Seraphim cry out, holy, holy, holy. 
Isaiah realizes that he is a man of unclean lips, but God provides the way of purity. We read, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. O Lord, have mercy on us. Our epistle reading comes to us from the second chapter of Acts, the first part of verse 14, and then verses 22 through 36. And other than verse 14, it begins on page 1166. And our epistle reading is the continuation of Peter's Pentecost sermon. Now he points people by the power of the Holy Spirit to the truth about Jesus and how Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. We read, But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. O Lord, have mercy on us. Please stand for the Gospel reading. And the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter, the first 17 verses, beginning on page 1136. And our gospel reading begins with Nicodemus coming to Jesus and Jesus giving him a lesson about being born again. But then as the discussion continues, it dives into the truth that Jesus is here because of God's great love for the whole world. We read. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs as you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, 
Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. O Lord, have mercy on us. We turn to page 221 in our hymnals for the common responsory. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Does anyone here have a favorite love story? Fiction or historical? Anyone have a favorite love story? No one? Come on. Someone must have a favorite love story. Oh, fine. What would you say is the most famous love story, real or fiction? All right, say that nice and loud. Romeo and Juliet, probably the most well-known love story, especially for anyone that speaks and reads English. Anyone else have a favorite love story that they can think of out of the cobwebs? Maybe it's too early Memorial Day weekend to, to think about such things. Cinderella! All right, Cinderella. All right, there we go. Anyone else? Go ahead, Marlene. There we go. Gone with the wind, right? Scarlett O'Hara and Rhett Butler. Mr. M was here on Wednesday for sixth grade graduation, and he immediately said, Casablanca. All right, how about, I think perhaps the most famous especially in the Western world, the most famous love story in history might have been Mark Antony and Cleopatra. All right, perhaps, this is, I don't know if this is true or not, but maybe the most well-known American love story, this might, you might not have thought of it this way, but Bonnie and Clyde might be the most famous American love story. Um, if we're going into fiction, you know, I think we got to throw in Robin Hood and Maid Marian. Superheroes. Oh, Marlene's got one. Adam and Eve. Okay. I don't know. Yes, we're going to mention them in a little bit, but the Bible doesn't talk too much about their love story, does it? Right? But yeah, Adam and Eve. We'll get to it. Yeah. Um, Clark Kent and Lois Lane. All right. Now, I would personally throw in from TV Jim and Pam from The Office. Now, does anyone here know the story of the Taj Mahal? Ken does. Do you know that the Taj Mahal has a love story behind it? Right? Um, Shah Jahan, the fifth Mughal emperor in India built it in memory of his favorite wife who had died after giving birth to their 13th child. Her name was Mumtaz Mahal. 
And his mourning plunged the whole area of India into a two-year period of mourning. But the Taj Mahal was meant to be a lasting symbol of his love for her. Now these are all just romantic stories. There are plenty of other love stories that aren't romantic. A mother's love for her child, a grandfather's love for a grandchild, sibling love, friendship, the soldier's love for his country, a teacher's love for her students. And on and on I could go with the different kinds of love in this world. Today we celebrate Trinity Sunday. And you can make the case that Trinity Sunday is another one of those love stories. It's not a romantic story, but it's a story of God loving his creation to no end. It isn't, you know, a, a romantic story, but it's a story of self-sacrificial love, what we would call agape love. And it might be the greatest love story ever told. It's a love story because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But that love story began in the Old Testament. And we can look at it through our Old Testament story. In our Old Testament reading, the prophet Isaiah has a vision of God on his heavenly throne. Right? It's what one might expect. There's angels, especially seraphim in particular, with six wings calling out to one another from the, around the throne of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Right? And smoke arose. And the whole room shook. I thought with our storms, maybe we could get thunder at that point in time. But no luck. But three times those seraphim cry out, Holy, holy, holy. There is no doubt God is holy. He is perfect. He is without sin. And he can't be in the presence of sin. And this holy God, he is the one true God. He is one. The holy God declared through Moses, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So we have these two very important characteristics of God, and he's willing to lay down these all on the line for you. Someone somewhere once suggested that you can know how much someone loves you by what they are willing to sacrifice for you. God was willing to put his oneness and his holiness on the line for you. He was willing to give up what was the, the defining details about himself to love you. He does, does that by assuming the human nature into the Godhead. Now, how do we confess what God is and who he is when he's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yet he's not three gods, but one God. He is one God in three persons. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't the Father. We speak these words, the triune nature of God, because it's how God truly loves you. We believe in this triune nature of God so that Jesus could lay down his life for you, so that a holy God could join us sinners in this sinful world and declare each of you holy, all so that he could love you forever. And it isn't for the perfect people that God came to love. He came to love the most obnoxious, awful, worst sinners imaginable. Jesus entered our world to love the people who have messed up our love stories the most. John says he loves the whole world. And look at the world. See how it defines love. It no longer defines love by serving one another. It defines love by how it can serve oneself. Some of the examples I gave earlier of love have been so corrupted that some of our sinful minds went to the inappropriate direction just by mentioning it. And then let's talk about that romantic love for a minute. Almost all those stories that we mentioned about romantic love, they are far from perfect. I mean, Romeo and Juliet, we glorify the story but it has a tragic ending. 
that no one should mimic. I mentioned Jim and Pam from The Office. Some of you are going to now watch the episode, see who are Jim and Pam in The Office, and be like, how could Pastor mention them? Because even our sinful nature has corrupted our most precious moments of love. Right? And this, this, this sinfulness of love isn't just out there in the world, about in the minds of some crazy people. This sinfulness is found inside of us. For all of us have our own warped sense of what love is and how we love others and what we expect them how to love us. I mean, there should be nothing wrong with romantic love. After all, God tells Adam and Eve, Marlene, that the two shall become one flesh. He commands Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, but sinfulness has infiltrated every single one of our love stories and love songs. Husbands and wives don't love each other perfectly, but rather selfishly. Now marriage is viewed as something to be put off for just another time. Or it's viewed as a curse instead of a blessing. Our jokes and insinuations all say so. Instead of uplifting it as God's gift, that it is, we tear it down. Instead of seeing how, how we can, one another has sacrificed and love for each other, couples argue and bitter, bicker over who is worse and who's more at fault. And this boils over into our familial relationships. Parents don't love their children perfectly. Children, especially as they're closer to those teenage years, maybe don't love their parents like they should. Siblings are torn apart by inheritance issues and bicker about who was mom or dad's favorite. Teachers make mistakes. Students sometimes act out against teachers. The soldier who loves his country can feel betrayed by his country. The country can sometimes ask the soldier to cross a line that shouldn't be crossed. Friendships hit rocky waters. And on and on we can go about how broken our relationships are in the people whom we love. And despite all that, God still looks at each of you and says, yes, I love you. I, the holy and perfect God, became human for you. The Son of God was lifted like a serpent on the pole in the wilderness, on the cross, so that all who believe in him can have eternal life. The Trinity teaches us how God's love led him to the cross. I mean, how could God die, we would have to ask. How could God be in heaven and on earth at the same time? How can there be three in one and one in three? But these are the kinds of questions our God was willing to have us ask. These are the things God was willing to do for you. Because he loved you. And with that holiness that those, those seraphim sang about, he now declares you holy. For the sake of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, God cries out through his servants of the word. Isaiah's lips were unclean. God provided the charcoal to purify those lips. Jesus' blood, the blood of the Son, purifies you, makes you clean, declares you holy. And he makes your love stories holy. He washes away the dirtiness and brokenness that has happened in your relationships and families. He knows firsthand what it takes to love you and the whole world. Even when it meant putting his oneness and his holiness on the line for you. He thought you were worth it. You were worth loving that way into eternity. And by that great truth, what you love can last into eternity too because of what our triune God was willing to put on the line for you and for all people. In the name of Jesus, amen. We now continue our worship by singing hymn 644. Uh, why am I blanking out on this? The church is one foundation.
We now turn to page 319 for the Athanasian Creed. And we confess this responsibly whole verse by whole verse. That means I will read the odd verses, and you will respond with the even verses. We stand as we turn to page 319. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. And the Catholic faith is this. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. Yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. In the same way, the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, the Holy Spirit Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also we are, pro we are prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or lords. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. But the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity and unity and unity and Trinity is to be worshipped. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and he is man, born from the substance of, the, of his mother in this age. equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. For as the rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life, and those who have done evil into eternal fire. We turn to him 941. We praise you, acknowledge you, O God, for our canticle.
please be seated for our offering. We continue our worship with the order of prayer, beginning with the Kyrie on page 227. Please stand. Be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal trinity by the confession of a true faith, and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign at one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord of hosts, your ways are inscrutable and your judgments unsearchable. Through your word, give us an everlasting, growing understanding of the depths of your riches, wisdom, and knowledge, that we may glorify you forever. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, Matthew, our synod president, John, our district president, Greg, our circuit visitor, and all pastors have heard your voice calling them to be your servants. Grant to them the spirit so that they can always say, Here I am, send me to whatever you ask. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, you delivered up your Son according to your definite plan and foreknowledge to be our Savior. Make our hearts glad in this faith that our tongues may rejoice and our flesh may dwell in hope. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, you sit enthroned as King forever. Bless Joseph, our President, Tony, our Governor, and all who rule us in your stead with wisdom and understanding, that truth and justice may prevail in our land and lawlessness may be kept at bay. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, we thank you for the many blessings you've bestowed upon this nation. Grant us a long memory to recall those who gave the full measure of devotion to our country's peace and security. Bring to mind the sacrifice of those who served faithfully until death in the protection of our freedom and the defense of our land. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, uphold Judy, Stacy, Donna, Marilyn, K Elaine, Jerry, Helen, Carol, Kim, Bruce, Marion, Iona, Elmer, and Linda, and all who suffer in our midst by your truth, that since you are at their right hand, they cannot be shaken. Gladden their hearts, cause their tongues to rejoice, and make their flesh dwell in hope. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of hosts, we give you thanks for Trinity Lutheran School. We rejoice that our sixth graders have completed their studies. Guide them with your love that they may always trust that your love will never fail them. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, 
You've safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings be ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we remain standing for our closing hymn, 507, Holy, Holy, Holy. Please be seated. Well, it's good to see each and every one of you here this morning as we gather around God's Word on this Trinity Sunday and are reminded of what God was willing to put on the line to love you. A couple of announcements. Our remodeling project for our school classrooms has begun. We've been able to raise the money also for our, our a new hallway flooring and to paint the hallway as well. So, uh, so uh, that is well underway. And if you were planning to help and didn't sign up, let Jean or Jim uh, Hesse know. Their phone numbers are in the bulletin. Also, we are saying farewell to our principal and his wife. We're really having a farewell to Sabrina party because Kyle says he doesn't want one, right? Melanie's really excited because she gets to host. She found out last week for the first time. So now she's prepared for this announcement, yeah. 
Yes, but uh, let Emily know uh, as soon as you can that you are coming. So we have the right amount of beverages and food, and it's also a potluck, so please feel free to bring a dish to pass. But that is this Saturday at 3 o'clock at Jeremy's house. If you can't read, the, can't read their address, he's right here. You can ask him. So, right. Um, any other announcements? None? Then let's conclude the Bible verse of the month. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. God's blessings to you this week.